I've been a refractive surgeon and a cornea surgeon for uh, almost 20 years now. Time goes fast. And uh, I'd like to share with you uh, some uh, basic signs that we've reported over the last few years, as well as some clinical pearls in our everyday practice. And uh, it has been speculated for many years that uh, in keratoconus, the uh, cornea epithelium responds to the thinning and the ectasia of the cornea in a very uh, vivid way. Uh, and we all know that the uh, uh, thinning of the cornea elicits uh, thinning of the uh, epithelium as well, and the area adjacent to the uh, thinning of the cornea makes the epithelium become thicker in an attempt of nature with its plasticity to cover the irregularity and reduce the symptoms. Uh, this ha has been shown in the past with uh, high-frequency ultrasound, uh, and we are now seeing a device uh, through the uh, RT view that can very efficiently, uh, very quickly, in the hands of our uh, technicians, uh, image uh, not only the total cornea pachymetry, but as well as the epithelial maps. So I will take a step further, maybe uh, uh, bringing a controversial statement and saying that in my practice, and this is mainly anterior segment, cataract, refractive, and cornea transplantation, of all the equipment that we use, if I had to choose one, which one would be the most important besides my clinical evaluation, it would be this. Uh, and this is uh, the uh, report by the uh, OptiView anterior segment spectral domain OCT that gives me the right and left, uh, the right and left eye total pachymetries of the cornea. And I like the way they're placed because it gives me a sense of symmetry, uh, as well as the epithelial maps, and of course, uh, anterior posterior keratometry. I think Eric will cover that later, and total cornea power, and how helpful this is even for my cataract patients. Uh, so this is not something I do in patients that I'm suspecting keratoconus. This is something we do on everybody who walks through the office. Uh, this is our routine exam for the last three years on every single patient that we see. Because I've come through the these years to realize that even if somebody comes in for refraction, it's very important to have a feel of the cornea epithelium and how that could potentially affect the refraction. More specifically, a contact lens wearer who has warpage, it's going to light up immediately on the epithelium maps, and then going into more complicated things such as pre-op and post-op for routine uh, re laser refractive surgery in the cornea, um, and uh, uh, cataract patients as well. So I'm going to share with you some of the work we've done on this and, and the argument that we make that for early keratoconus and keratoconus diagnosis besides something that we ophthalmologists like to do in meetings has acquired a very important meaning today because we do have the vaccine for, for early keratoconus. We can cross-link a young keratoconic patient who's beginning to have keratoconus and eradicate the disease. When I trained as a cornea surgeon in the U.S. in 94, 95, the options were glasses, contact lenses, or transplant. And this has changed. So now it's not only an esoteric hobby of us that we want to see who has keratoconus, who does not, but this is a humongous healthcare issue for every country on, on this planet. We have a significant percentage in Greece. We estimate about one out of every 20 young Greeks has keratoconus that requires our attention. So this is a, a significant healthcare problem. Now what was known, and this is work we did with high frequency ultrasound, what was known is that the epithelium is irregular in keratoconus. What was not known that we found and reported, and this is uh, almost four years now, is that the overall epithelial thickness in keratoconic eyes is increased. Who cares in an eye that has significant keratoconus? Even my children, working often with my computer at home, can pick up an eye that's keratoconic now. They're ages 8 to 12. I'm not sure if they're going to be ophthalmologists, but it's easy to pick up an obvious keratoconus. So we're talking about the very subtle cases, and the important data here is that in normal eyes, the cornea epithelium is very universal. It's one of the most universal uh, metrics in the human body, actually, regardless of age, sex, refractive error, uh, uh, place uh, that somebody is living, the cornea epithelium is very universal, and this is central, peripheral, and overall uh, cornea epithelium in normal eyes. And you can see that in keratoconic eyes, the overall 
cornea epithelium is much thicker. Uh, and in keratoconic eyes that have undergone cornea cross-linking, they're still irregular, but we've taken away the elasticity of the cornea. These numbers drop beneath normal. So we speculated that the uh, reasons that keratoconus progresses, the increased elasticity of the cornea, probably have something to do with the epithelium responding to it and remodeling and becoming thicker. And this uh, does uh, uh, require uh, significant attention in eyes that were suspecting keratoconus. Of course, the high-frequency ultrasound is a device you can also punish your patients that you don't like because it takes about a half hour to 45 minutes to obtain an image, and it's a water bath. And especially for women with makeup all over the place, you can imagine how nice of a picture that is for a uh, high-end refractive surgery practice. And then the era of OCT, which all our esteemed retina colleagues used, and we were always envious, you have all these great imaging of the retina, uh, was able to give us similar maps. And uh, we reiterated these, these data with uh, the RT view. We uh, found that uh, uh, what, uh, the uh, conclusions we had with high-frequency ultrasound mirrored uh, were mirrored with the uh, OptiView uh, device. You can see the very elegant maps of epithelium. This is the normal eye uh, of a normal patient, and this is the uh, keratoconic uh, eye with the epithelium. And obviously, we're more interested in the patient that's somewhere in between, the patient who's a suspect and will, sign, will, will show early signs of epithelial asymmetry. And then we, we thought that in order to establish a norm, we, we evaluate a large number of patients, normal patients, to find out what's normal with this methodology. And I'm sure that many other uh, OCT devices will follow, but OptiView is leading the pack uh, on this, and we reported what is normal. And we did find and establish what I'm uh, conveying to you today, that cornea epithelium is extremely homogeneous. Uh, and this is uh, overall. Uh, central, superior, inferior, and temporal uh, in all patients, all ages, and all refractive errors. So it is one of those metrics that is very rare on the human body, kind of like the core body temperature. We're all at 36.8 degrees in here, regardless if we stay here, if it heats up, if we walk, uh, take a walk in Alaska. And, and I don't claim to know when this changes what the pathology is, but it's worth our attention. Uh, and we, on stepping on this study, we also reported uh, something interesting. We found out that all our dry eye patients, and as a LASIK surgeon, I have plenty of those, uh, had a peculiar epithelial distribution that's uh, noteworthy. Uh, the epithelium is different than uh, the normal. And uh, in that regard, uh, we were able to identify dry eye, which is easy to do with other means in uh, everyday practice, but it's nice to have a objective metric, especially when you're treating post-refractive surgery dry eye, or even, and this is an important parameter, post-cataract surgery dry eye that may affect the quality of vision, especially in an era where we're very much interested in quality of vision early on, specialty lenses, multifocal lenses, et cetera. Um, so, uh, this is the dry eye data, and then we uh, evaluated and reported. We have over, I think, 15 or 20 papers on the epithelial maps with the OptiView. The, these are post-LASIK patients and how their uh, uh, epithelial remodeling is affected. This is post-cataract surgery uh, uh, study looking at uh, the preoperative cataract patient and how the epithelial distribution is. We can all agree now as we're learning a little bit through this pathway that this patient has a little bit of dry eye. There's a little bit of yellow on the epithelial maps, nothing on the total cornea thickness map, and this is that eye a week later. And, and we cannot really assess visual quality a week later, regardless if the patient is happy, if it, it's hemotropic with such an irregular epithelial distribution. This is a month later and three months later, and you can see how this normalizes, thus uh, bringing uh, the bar to assessing a cataract data uh, clear cornea uh, cataract surgery data at three, uh, the three-month interval. Um, and uh, this is uh, our report on evaluating epithelial maps after LASIK, and they have a very particular distribution. These maps, the studies that we've done, are based on the six millimeter ability of the device. We're now uh, just starting to work with the uh, uh, beta software on nine millimeter, giving us a broader area of the cornea. 
And again, if you're assessing quality of vision in a LASIK patient at night, you really have to have this picture in mind. And I think that every refractive surgeon today has to um, uh, engulf this technology in order to explain uh, and, and in order to help them in, uh, in managing these patients, quality of vision, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we even studied this in uh, post the sec uh, patients. Uh, these are obviously patients that have significant cornea edema. The epithelium responds to that, and uh, you can see how uh, the epithelium is at this very uh, demeter stage of a uh, bolus keratopathy patient, uh, and how after the successful dissect surgery, of course, the cornea thickens overall, but it's thinner than it was on itself, including the graft. And look at the remarkable difference on the cornea epithelium, and also another a tool to assess the visual quality of these patients. Um, we also tried to correlate the epithelial distribution according to how much myopia we correct. And we found that there is a direct correlation. The higher the myopia, the more irregular the epithelium was uh, in these eyes. And then uh, we tried to correlate uh, this epithelial uh, idiosyncrasy with eyes that had LASIK and cross-linking a preemptive measure to stabilize the very high myopes. And interestingly enough, we found that uh, for uh, LASIK and cross-linking for low myopias, it didn't make much of a difference. But in high myopias, these are the minus sevens and th these are the minus eights. The standalones had a significant epithelial remodeling. The LASIK with cross-linking had a, uh, the same epithelial distribution with low myopias. So this we uh, think is a significant finding in, in uh, uh, potentially manipulating the quality of vision that these patients have through the epithelial remodeling. And again, uh, looking uh, at this in patients that have undergone collagen cross-linking and how uh, the epithelial distribution is affected, um, you can see here uh, obviously a patient that has keratoconus uh, in one eye and this is the other normal eye, quote unquote, that the epithelial map will be very significant to predict whether that eye would change. And there was a very close correlation to suspect cases and uh, the epithelial distribution variability. Um, then we looked at pachymetry maps, uh, both total cornea and epithelium, and suggested this in these indices, they're similar with the indices available in cyclic imaging of the cornea, the pentacam that we all know, and they proved to be extremely sensitive comparing the supero nasal total cornea thickness with the infratemporal, which traditionally in keratoconus have significant difference, and the superior to inferior, and these indices have a very significant uh, sensitivity in diagnosing keratoconus, with only one exception, the extremely rare, and this is one of the 10 cases I've seen so far in my career in 20 years, where keratoconus looks like a bullseye target, it's exactly in the center of the cornea. And this is where these parameters obviously do not apply. This is a very extreme case of uh, nipple or central keratoconus. Um, so uh, a very helpful tool in, in uh, assessing patients. For instance, this patient who in pachymetry looks suspicious for keratoconus, this is the other healthy eye of a keratoconic patient. And the epithelial distribution here shows uh, uh, a irregularity. So I won't bore you with these uh, very complicated and specific data. At the end of the day, uh, we found that there's direct correlation by associating these indices of total cornea thickness and epithelial thickness uh, and their asymmetry with uh, suspect keratoconus. And as I mentioned, it's not as important to make the diagnosis on a given keratoconic patient, but the key question, and we had two courses today on, on the diagnosis of keratoconus and cornea epithelium at the main sessions, is what changes first in keratoconus? Is it a thickness change first? Does the stroma change first? Or the curvature changes first? And we don't have a clear question, but with the data and what we're learning uh, with the um, OptiView ability to uh, to uh, image the cornea epithelium is that we probably have a stromal thickness change first. And the only reason we don't see that in our cornea topography is because the epithelium is compensating for that cornea thickness change 
with it thinning and thickening in the early keratoconic cornea, taking away the early findings from uh, topography. Um, so uh, we're able to uh, assess these um, in uh, early keratoconic patients. Here, for instance, we can see progression through uh, indices of asymmetry, uh, but uh, in uh, suspect keratoconic patients, this would be a suspect case for me because the corneal pachymetry is a little bit irregular. There's a little bit of topographic irregularity. This will be a non-suspect. In these cases, having a uh, direct image of the cornea epithelium will help making the diagnosis or perhaps uh, establishing a change uh, in these patients. If, and th if, if this is a 18, 90 year old male uh, in southern Europe, this could be probably uh, the earlier sign of keratoconus and the ability to offer for uh, collagen cross thinking and, uh, and um, stabilizing the ectatic disorder. Uh, so I'd like to show this slide because we're all. Physicians are used to looking at uh, topography maps, but one has to uh, uh, understand what each technology does. And you can see a simple, a simple case of central cloudy dystrophy of Francois, uh, how it makes Pentacam imaging go crazy. Uh, the Pentacam sine fluke imaging uh, catches the cloudiness in the cornea and, and tells us there's a significant depression. Placido disc is not very accurate in the center, uh, multicolor. Uh, reflection topography is more accurate in the center showing against the rule of stigmatism. And again, in these cases, the judge may be uh, a, uh, a OptiView pachymetry map that would establish that this is probably wrong, and epithelial map that will uh, clue us in whether this finding or this finding is more objective. Um, so it is one of uh, uh, my basic criteria for keratoconus, looking at the epithelial maps as well as the pachymetry maps by the OptiView, two of my three criteria for keratoconus come from the device. Mm -hmm. And I'll close with uh, just uh, a few simple examples. This is an established keratoconus eye with the uh, uh, parameters. This is a, uh, an eye that all the metrics on the Pentacam show that it's normal. Again, uh, nothing significantly abnormal in this uh, image. Actually, significantly abnormal in this image and this is the other eye that looks absolutely normal on, uh, on uh, Pentacam. And this is the abnormal eye. And this is the normal eye. So this eye was viewed normal by the Pentacam. And by looking at the epithelial map, I ask you, does this look normal? In our eyes, it doesn't, because the epithelium has already awakened, probably, f from the cornea regularity and is remodeling. And this is not normal epithelial distribution. So. If this was a young patient, 20 year old patient, we would of course treat the ectatic eye, but I would strongly suggest with this finding that this eye was stabilized as well. Of course, the game is changing, and, and thank you, OptiView, for allowing us to now go out to nine millimeters, and you can see again uh, the overall epithelial thickening, thickening in this uh, keratoconic eye. The cornea, the total cornea map shows us the thinning of the cornea here and the obvious keratoconus, and the epithelium te tells an e even stronger story as it's trying to compensate for this irregularity. It thickens significantly over the uh, thin area, but the over epithelial thickness is far uh, uh, thicker than what we saw before. And another nice uh, uh, adjunct for uh, people who do retreatments, and we do this sometime in refractive surgery, uh, subtraction stromal map, uh, as the epithelium is able now to be subtracted from a total cornea map and getting a pure stromal map for our surgical planning. So I think epithelium is an essential tool. I cannot imagine my practice anymore, not just surgical or cornea practice, without being able to assess uh, the patient's visual function in correlation with the epithelial maps. Uh, I think it's crucial for cornea refractive and cataract refractive surgery. And as far as keratoconus is, in my mind, a significant parameter, and I think we have most of the world thinking about epithelium thanks to uh, the ability of uh, having it in a click of our hand uh, in our offices. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Is there any question from the audience? It seems to be a very, very attractive tool to detect or to screen patients. 
I have a two short question regarding dry, for example. Do you use or can you use this technique to differentiate different types of dry, for example, TF instability with a normal epithelium and those patients with abnormal epithelium and KCS? Is it possible to have differentiation uh, in terms absolutely. of regularity, for example? Absolutely. As we, we do use it as well to assess how our treatment is working. For instance, start with uh, tears, blephritis treatment, and then map that patient a few months down. Of course, subjective data in our clinical exam is important, but being able to validate that with the objective epithelial data helps a lot along the way. We, we have found the OptiView maps a crucial partner in managing dry eye after LASIK. Uh, it's almost, I can al almost tell you how long ago a patient had LASIK by just looking at an epithelial map of a LASIK patient. So it helps a lot reinforce uh, the patient's compliance, the regimen that you'll use, whether it's uh, replacing uh, lipids or, uh, or uh, aque the aqueous component. Uh, and I think that it's changed really the way we treat dry eye. But not only in pathology, if for instance a patient contact lens wearer came in for a refraction, I would be very hesitant writing that prescription for spectacle or, or lenses if there was warpage on the epithelial maps. And I would recommend to that patient before I gave my signature on a prescription, you know, stay off lenses for three, four days, come back, and sure enough, the epithelial maps have normalized and I feel much more confident prescribing that the patient that prescription. And maybe you can use it also for detecting patients at risk of developing dry post LASIK. Exactly. So it's also very important to detect the, those patients and maybe treat them before. Exactly. Eric. I have a question for you, John, about the post of refractive lens uh, surgery with implantation of a multi focal eye wire, and the patient is not happy. Most of the time it's due to dry eyes. You look at the epithelial map, and what do you look for in those cases? What, what uh, raises the red flag? Well, it, it's very, and thank you for the question. It's an excellent question, Eric. Uh, the the uh, data, those maps that we show, come with very sensitive statistical data. So you're able to see the thicker and thinner in numbers, and the cornea epithelium should not deviate more than two or three microns. Uh, and then the standard deviation, the standard deviation should be under two microns. So in the patient post, let's say you do, we do a multifocal lens and the patient is complaining, and, and, and in the map the standard deviation is four microns, and the thicker to thinner is eight microns, that is a case crying out that we need to treat the dry eye. And, and not only for us, it gives us reassurance that nothing went wrong in the calculation of the surgery, but it's also nice to convey that because those are usually patients who are highly motivated, they understand computers, uh, they understand uh, statistical data, and they can follow and get reinforced as their dry eye goes away. Do you also do a pre-op? Yes. yes. Do you compare them also? Everybody who walks through the door in our office gets a OptiView pachymetry and epithelial map. Everybody, every visit, every time. I think it's a very valuable tool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah? One, one more question. Right, right. Warpage. Warpage, yes. Uh, we wait for the surgery and the power workage is gone. What is the difference in macros that you tolerate the it, it's a very good question, and, and I will convey you my clinical practice and feel. I by no means want to consider this as dogma, and everybody has to do that, but we feel that the standard deviation of normal cornea epithelium has to be under 2 microns. Yeah, the first standard deviation, which, which is 75% of the cases, so under 2 microns. So everything over 2 microns will make me very skeptical whether I should base my refractive data and do LASIK on that patient. I like to see numbers better than that. Thank you very much. Thank you.